Without further ado, let's dive into our first session, Outcomes of COP28. And joining us to provide the introduction for this panel is Professor Mark Maslin, the Pro Vice Provost for Climate Crisis at UCL. It turns out I'm the, also the all-powerful being because I found the clicker. Okay, so I am now in complete control of everything. Um, so I have a very wonderful job, which is just to try and introduce you to the COP meetings, which everybody talks about, but what are they? We've had 28 of them. You heard Al Gore say that we've had them. Now, the interesting thing is they're really complicated. So in the middle, you have the negotiations. This is where the 90, 198 countries get together and they try to actually get treaties on many different things. Sometimes you only hear the top line. But that's just a very small part. We have underneath that the blue zone. This is the zone where lots of pavilions for the countries, the World Bank, there's an indigenous people's pavilion, there's a young people's pavilion, and this is where lots of negotiation and pressure goes on to countries, but also to the actual negotiators. And that's a huge part of the deal. And then outside that, you have business. So business knows that everybody they want to do business with will be there, so they turn up as well. And as we saw in Glasgow, civil society. Huge protests on every single subject. Huge uh, sort of like demonstrations on both the Friday with Fridays for Future and then on the Saturday when it felt like everybody in Glasgow went on the streets. So, Glasgow, okay, we actually achieved something at Glasgow. What did we achieve? Well, the first thing, it was 2021. It was delayed by a year because of COVID. And what was interesting is that allowed the Italian and UK governments to have an extra year of negotiation because international politics is hard and actually takes a lot of time. And it was about ratcheting up. We had the Paris Agreement that says we will limit the climate change to two degrees with an aspirational target of one and a half degrees. And then Glasgow was the let's see what people are going to pledge and see how we can actually improve that. So what happened? So we had strong targets of one and a half degrees. Uh, we had the term phasing down of coal and removal of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Now, that may not sound very much, but that is the first time in a climate agreement that fossil fuels were ever mentioned. 2021, okay? Sounds amazing. Article 6, the rule book on carbon accounting between countries and how you measure it was finally agreed. But what did we fail? We failed still to give the 100 billion to the least developed countries to move away from fossil fuels. We agreed that in 2009, and guess what? Still we haven't given it. And I have to say, that sort of loose change for the developed world, we did not create the loss and damage facility, and I have to say, one of the scenes that will stick with me was Alex Sharma, who was the president of COP, actually having tears in his eyes because he didn't achieve this. And the actual pledges, great, but guess what? They're nowhere near the 1.5. We're still at 2.4 to 2.8 degrees warming, but it moved forward. Egypt, hmm, okay. Okay, so in Egypt, uh, a year later, we were hoping it was going to ratchet up. This was the African COP. It was going to be about adaptation, and perhaps I should move on. So really, <laughs> really, all we did for two weeks was keep the Glasgow Climate Pact alive, because there was so much effort to try and water it down. But on the Sunday, the loss and damage uh, facility was finally agreed to be set up which I thought we'd done in Paris in 2015, but it turns out this was the real agreement that we were going to set it up. And guess what? We still hadn't got any further with these. So we moved to Dubai, and as you can see, this is a dear friend, Simon, who will be on the panel lately, you know, and next. And 
we have a weird thing, which is we have a president of COP who is also the CEO of the National Oil and Gas Company. Hmm, we're in the heart of the actual sort of like oil and gas region in the Middle East. But what came out of it? Strong statement on one and a half degrees, uh, despite the fact in the last 12 months we have actually gone over 1.5. But you know, let's leave that to one side. And the statement, transition away from fossil fuels in energy systems in a just, orderly and equitable manner to achieve net zero by 2050 in keeping with the science. You can see that, as Al Gore said, there's a few loopholes in there. But, you know, again, it is announcing the end of fossil fuels, and the panel will discuss what does it actually mean. Global stock take, which was really important, showed that we're nowhere near keeping the climate to 1.5. Loss and damage was agreed. The World Bank will administer it, but I love this. They will charge 24%. So one in four dollars that uh, countries gift to this fund will be taken by the World Bank to make sure that it all works. Um, and we still failed with the 100 billion. There's no new pledges. And we have not really agreed about the loss and damage facility, how will it operate, and who will be able to claim. So I will leave you with this, OK? So this was Joel Pett's wonderful cartoon in US today, just before the Copenhagen Conference in 2009, which of course had huge amounts of hope and crashed awfully. And again, we could have energy independence, preserve the rainforest, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water, clean air, healthy children, and there's always someone on the back, but not at this meeting, uh, saying, what if it's a big hoax and we've actually created a better world for nothing? Um, and on that note, guess where we're going next? <laughs> Azerbaijan. Um, and by the way, unlike Dubai, who actually played the game, yeah, there were no women in the 28 organizing committee. And guess what? The ex-oil uh, chief for the country is the chairman yet again. I'll leave you with that. And um, the panelists will <laughs> examine this and give you a lot more insights. And now, uh, let's welcome our esteemed panelists to the stage. Joining us for this panel is Priti Parikh, Professor of Infra Infrastructure Engineering and International Development at UCL. Simon Chin Yi, Lecturer in International Development at UCL. And uh, Mark Watts, Director of C40. A very warm welcome to you all, and thank you so much for being with us. I was uh, myself very excited for this discussion that we are going to have. And Priti, um, if I may, I'm going sure. to start uh, with you and asking you, given your expertise in infrastructure engineering and international development, how do you see the impact of climate change on infrastructure, particularly in low- and middle-income countries. So it's lovely to be here on Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day. And I'm really pleased to raise this question, Shuka, because the problem is that poor and vulnerable communities in low- and middle-income countries bear the double whammy of poor infrastructure and climate change. So we have populations who struggle with decent living conditions, poor housing stock, lack of access to infrastructure, and then they are fighting and battling with the adverse impact of climate change, whether it's flooding or other climate-related events. And you know what the biggest tragedy is? Uh, they are not the big emitters and contributors, so the poorest 50% of the population are responsible for 10% of emissions. So I would argue that it's a triple whammy, that we have poor housing, infrastructure, they unfortunately are located in areas which are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, and they are not responsible for it. So for me, that's the biggest tragedy. And thinking about COP28, there, were, there was some excitement over initial pledges around infrastructure or around 
adaptation or loss and damage. It started off at $400 million and it ramped up a bit. But do you know how much we need to sort out the infrastructure to give people decent living conditions? We need about $3.3 trillion a year. So it's not millions, it's not billions, it's trillions of dollars needed every year so that people have access to basic services, so that people can think about economic well-being, not growth, economic well-being, equity, justice, prosperity. They can live a decent life and they can kind of withstand the shocks and stresses. So I think that's the big challenge around infrastructure in low middle income countries and climate change. Uh, yeah, and so uh, we talked about um, the least privileged communities and countries, and I note, Simon, that your research focuses on climate change conflict um, and vulnerable populations in Africa and, of course, small state na uh, in nations. And so why do you think um, the COP process and the COP28 outcomes are so important um, to these vulnerable nations and communities. Yeah, thanks, uh, Shukran. Uh, if I may start with just the story of COP27, actually. I had 10 minutes uh, spare time, and I was, happened to be at the Moana Pavilion. Now, the Moana Pavilion is where the pieces, where the Pacific Island states congregate to, to put on events like this, for example. And I just had 10 minutes because I was, I was researching small island states at the time, specifically the, these, uh, these pieces. And there was someone in the corner and they had a, uh, a virtual reality thing. And I was like, okay, I have 10 minutes. They're like, oh, come, we're gonna show us this thing. I'm like, okay. And I put it on and it was 50 minutes long. I was like, oh my goodness. And I'm someone who works on small island states as well. And so I was like, okay. And it basically showed a, a community in the Pacific in an island and the devastation that hurricanes and natural disasters can bring to those areas, right? So I'm literally uh, having it on, I'm listening to it. And when I took it off, they had sat someone from the Pacific Islands, a woman as, like, as close as you are to me, Mark, right? And I took mine off, slightly bored, and she was in tears. And she was in tears because this is the reality for many of these small island states and African nations. She's in tears because they are at the front, the front line of climate change. They need to be at these conferences because they need other countries to act. Small island states, they have nothing to, uh, to mitigate. They have not, they're not emitting anything. Um, the 51 island states, I think they emit 0.5%, if that. You know, that they are also historically underrepresented at these conferences. They need to have their voices heard and if we're going to solve this problem because some of those countries are in danger of disappearing. So it's really important that they're there. The other thing I will mention is that a few years ago, I was for very fortunate to be on a panel with the late uh, Professor Hugh Seeley. He was a, uh, an advisor to the AOSIS, that's the Alliance of Small Island States, and he said very clearly, and I'm par paraphrasing here, but when he was looking, he's like, you know when you're looking, and another country in the eye, and you know that they don't care if you survive or not. You know that, but you still have to sit in those negotiations and, and work with them on something. Now, the last thing I'll say is positive, and I would say that AOSIS, for example, were really key on that loss and damage fund that Mark brought up. They were key in pushing that fund. If they weren't there, I'm not sure we would have gotten that fund. Exactly, Simon, and I couldn't agree uh, more with you on this and Pretty because we very much are aware uh, that the, the least privileged communities and countries are the, the most vulnerable. And um, I mean, I um, a few years back did a research on the coastal area in the Philippines. Mm. And uh, I'm talking about um, when I did the survey, some of these people are my friends. And to just go through the experiences that they basically have to witness and experience uh, um, annually on a yearly basis, month after month, that's just tragic. And the fact that the voices are not be it being heard the way it should, you know, it's, um, it's very important. Uh, now, Mark, coming to you as the executive director of C40, you oversee a network of the world's largest cities um, committed to 
climate action, how do city level policies and regulations contribute to global efforts to combat the climate crisis? Well, they, they have a big impact in, in the real world, in the real economy, because most of us live in cities. Three quarters of our energy is consumed in cities and therefore the emissions come from it. But actually, I think in the, in the context of discussion around COPs, the bigger thing is, is political leadership. Because what you've had, in, you know, we heard from Mark, you know, 28 COPs are very little progress, unfortunately. In the group of cities that, that I work with, these 100 biggest cities in the world, essentially, they set the tar a target in line with the, the aspiration of the Paris Agreement, 1.5 degrees, as a condition of membership of C40 back in 2016, so that to stay a member of the club, cities have to have a plan for how they're going to cut their emissions in line with their fair share of that 1.5 degree target, and then meet it year on year. And we can see now tracking that evidence where it's not perfect, but broadly on track across the network to halve emissions across those big cities by, by 2030. The vast majority of them are cutting their emissions much faster than their respective nation states. They should be. It's a bit easier to do it in, a big, in the capital cities, the big cities, than it is for the whole country. But nevertheless, uh, they're achieving it. But I think even more than that, they're, they've really shown that it's possible to have global political collaboration on a global problem like climate change. And they, you know, these mayors, when they come together, they have, they're across the entire political spectrum, totally different levels of development, cultures, geography but they agree to work together on one thing, which is solving the climate crisis. And that allows them not to confront each other, not to be negotiating, saying, we'll, we'll only cut our emissions if you cut yours by a bit more, but instead to look and learn from each other and copy good ideas. Yeah, that's, that's um, giving us a little bit of hope there, especially for the big cities, um, which are responsible for most of the emissions we're talking about here. Uh, Pretty, um, I'm going to ask, um, you about the role of um, sustainable infrastructure. I mean, your work has been instrumental. You've done a lot of research um, and solutions around water, sanitation, energy, clean cooking. Um, can you tell us more about the sustainable infrastructure in mitigating the effects of climate change and, of course, achieving the net zero? Thank you, Shuka. I'm going to start with the big picture and Mark, he kind of alluded to the fact that most of the growth is going to happen in cities. There will be cities in parts of the world where population will, will double in the next decade. So it's not just about meeting the existing gaps in infrastructure, it's about thinking of the future. And if we think about what the future holds in the next 20, 30 years, we've got 2 billion people on this planet who currently lack access to safe drinking water. 3.6 billion people who lack access to safe sanitation, nearly 800 million people who lack access to electricity, 3 billion people who lack access to clean cooking fuels. Uh, and this is a significant amount of the population who lack access to very basic infrastructure. So let's say my dream, which is that everyone in 20, 30 years time will have infrastructure comes through. Most of that infrastructure will be built in low middle income countries. So if we are building new infrastructure, planning new cities, we have a real opportunity here to look at nature-sensitive, climate-resilient infrastructure solutions. We can get it right from the outset. But for that, we need to change our way of thinking, which is what I would call whole life thinking. So rather than thinking about what is the infrastructure we're going to build, what are the initial costs of infrastructure, what is going to be the implications of running that infrastructure in terms of carbon, in terms of costs? And the two are very different things. And we've seen this play out in UK with some of our big infrastructure projects where the emphasis has been on short-term planning, the cost of building the infrastructure. But we need to move away to think about whole life thinking, systems thinking. What is the value addition of that infrastructure? To give a practical example, bridges. People see bridges as infrastructure, but bridges connect human beings to hospitals, to schools, to universities, to places of employment. So for me, thinking about infrastructure beyond what it entails is quite important. And to give another example, and you can see I like my numbers here a lot, um, I led a study to show that if you invest in proper sanitation, it benefits all 17 sustainable development goals and 130 
out of 169 SDG targets. So what that means is if you build infrastructure properly, thinking about the whole life, build nature sensitive infrastructure, look at green solutions, you can use it as an entry point to tackle both sustainability and climate change. Um, I love the green solutions. I'm going to pick up on that because it's not all doom and gloom. And uh, today we're here to focus on the green solutions. So we know that there's been a lot of positives and positive dialogues at COP28 as well. I was very excited when you were briefly telling me about it. Um, particularly on green hydrogen. And could you tell us more about it and its link to the vulnerable nations and also the very important issue of climate justice? So, yes, I will start with, the, I will go into the positive. The negative is that, thank God, we did have some dialogue on green hydrogen or clean solutions there because there was far too much talk on fossil fuels at this particular COP. Far too much. Uh, I was wasn't going to mention it <laughs> yet, but yeah. It was going to rear its head if you have Sultan Al Jabbar as the president of COP. And we're going to have it next year as well. But in, maybe not in the formal negotiations themselves, but in parallel, in multiple, multiple sessions, you had uh, this talk around different clean solutions. One of them was looking at green hydrogen. And I thought that was really interesting. So I attended the bilaterals and I went to high level ministerials around this. So there was talk on how uh, green hydrogen could be one of the clean green solutions, because what we know is that our populations are growing, right? In the African continent is predicted that there are going to be four times more people uh, by the end of the century. And they already lack energy. We're going to need more energy, so it's going to need to come from somewhere. And what I thought was, okay, let's start with the positive. What were the very positives that came out of these COPs and some of these dialogues were these bilaterals. So you had the players at the table. Also, I work for everyone here uh, in the shipping industry, right? So you had, but it wasn't just the shipping industry. You had industry at the table. You had the energy producers at the table. You had cities at the table. You had the countries at the table. You had the ports that, at the table. So you had all of these players at the table. And I don't know about you two, but I, by the end of two weeks at COP, I was sick, sick of being talked at by all these panels, and I apologize, I'm doing that to you now. Um, I just realized what I was saying as I was saying it aloud. But, uh, but, but so this particular workshop, we broke out in sessions and it was, it was great. We had the head of IKEA's uh, sustainability was there, for example. All of these different players to discuss actual solutions and the use of green hydrogen in this particular sector. The negative side of that is like, for example, in the high level ministerial, which this has to remain between us, um, you had a lot of business as usual talk, which means you had the industry blaming the energy sector and you had the energy sector blaming the industry and it was going around in circles and it was like, okay, so are we, like, like much of COP, unfortunately, much of the negotiations, there we are again. In terms of uh, certain countries that we work with here at UCL or I work with specifically, what we had at, over the past few COPs is, uh, around the workshops that we put on at the COP, is this idea of what the African nations, of the idea that there's so much resources there that we can harness. There's nine of the 10 sunniest countries in the world are on the African continent. You have Namibia, huge amounts of two tracts of green uh, ammonia there. Kenya, you have, uh, you have it all actually. You have wind, you have geothermal, you have hydro, you have um, uh, all of that, solar. Um, Comoros as well, small island state. Wind propulsion systems, amazing. So if we can harness these resources, we can solve some of the energy poor areas in the, uh, in the countries. We can work on different particular sectors, perhaps cities, for example, to provide them energy. And we can be actually part of that larger, wider global solution. Absolutely. And um, Mark, let's talk about ambitions. I mean, I'm all for ambitions, increasing ambitions and finding um, the right effective strategies in, in order to achieve those big, amazing objectives that we have. And so I know that um, C40 cities aim to halve global carbon emissions by 2030 uh, while reducing inequality and creating green jobs. So um, tell us about how it's, it's possible to increase the ambitions, uh, all those ambitions, and also what are the effective strategies that can be implemented? Well, I, th you know, I think you know, in, your, in your question there, it's, 
it, it's important to start from the science. I think that's the first thing here. We, we can't change the laws of physics. So we, the, the targets that the cities and C40 work back from are not what we think is possible now. We can you know, maybe persuade people to achieve it. What does the science say we need to do? With then a political overlay. So we, we start from, we need to halve global emissions by 2030, but, but our actual mission is to halve the use of fossil fuels by 2030, because that's, that's the real challenge, is the shift away from, from fossil fuels fast enough to allow that emission reduction. And, and then, you, know, then you, really, you get into the, ch the challenge then of how to do that in a way that improves justice and equity, creates jobs, not destroys them. So, you know, the, the sort of things our cities are working on now, uh, New York, for example, has, has brought in this local law 97, which requires that all those kind of famous skyscrapers across New York have to very quickly retrofit the, the, their buildings to make them more energy efficient and effectively be powered by renewable energy. That's led to a huge multi-billion dollar investment in, in new wind power supply into New York, 20,000 new jobs, in retrofitting those buildings. So it's a stimulus uh, to the economy. A harder, you know, harder in the same, same country, a harder example in Los Angeles where there the mayor took the right decision to close down two gas power stations 10 years earlier than their life would have allowed because they couldn't meet their carbon targets while those, those power stations were still in operation. Shift to investment in, in solar power, but a very difficult conversation then with the trade unions and the people who worked in those industry, but has led to a just transition commission where now the workers in those industries are seeing actually they've got as good if not better prospects shifting into what's a much a, gr a faster growing economy and that's you know the the good thing overall Al Gore said it is you know we see actually an even bigger differential in globally three times as many jobs in renewable energy as fossil fuels in an urban context it's six times as much often when you're looking at the comparison between improving the efficiency of existing infrastructure and powering it by renewable energy versus building a new gas power station or a new coal power station but those words, that those facts only matter if you can convince the individuals, the communities who, who are currently employed that they, they are going to have a new job. So that's where a lot of our work now, now, now goes in working at a big policy level, but then down to engaging trade unions, engaging individual communities so that they feel a part of that transition. And I think the key point here is to try to um, do that just transition as smoothly as possible because I think us as human beings are quite uncomfortable um, to changes and I think uh, we need the moral support, we need uh, to be emotionally supported that it's going to be okay and uh, yeah, um, challenges are just... Uh, I mean, so many challenges, and that brings me to you, Pretty, again, with the challenges and, of course, opportunities. Uh, what are the key challenges and opportunities in pushing back against climate change through energy solutions? But also, I think another important point is how can academia uh, collaborate with policymakers? Because, I mean, later on today, we're going to have our politicians on the panel. Uh, you all mentioned that we do need those policies and regulations in place if we are to achieve um, our objectives and if we are to um, do that green transition that is needed in time. Pretty. So I've been to three COPs and what struck me that this was the first COP where it was officially acknowledged that fossil fuels was the root cause of climate change. And I thought that was pretty obvious, but it wasn't. <laughs> <That's insane. laughs> so sometimes as academics, as scientists, we assume that something is obvious, but it's not. So it's important for scientists to be out there having those conversations, actively engaging with industry and policy making. And if we think about one of the outcomes from COP28, which was transitioning away, so it's not phasing out, phasing down, transitioning away from fossil fuels. I want to unpack that a little bit. Uh, the reason we've ended up with that outcome is that there are big nations who are reliant on fossil fuels. It requires them to change the supply chain. It would require, it would require a shift in kind of green, green skills, labor markets. And that, once again, has an impact on vulnerable and marginalized communities. So it's not as easy as it sounds, but we need the shift. And I'm working on quite an exciting project in Sub-Saharan Africa in collaboration with industry, 
um, who are installing solar home panels. So a panel, battery box, and basic energy appliances in villages in Africa. And as the academic partner, I'm looking into the data, developing machine learning models to understand how people who've never used electricity in their lives ever are now using electricity, what will we do with it in the future? And similarly, I'm looking at data around how people are taking up clean cooking solutions. When I say clean cooking, it's LPG, so it's still not perfect, but it's better than biomass. And what we're finding is that it's not just about the data and good science, which is important, but it's also about understanding why people do things, why people adopt technologies and what are the barriers. One of the biggest barriers was that fossil fuel, traditional infrastructure, is heavily subsidized by governments. But when we look at some of these new innovative green solutions, they don't receive the same subsidy, which means they're more expensive for customers. And these are customers who already are resource challenged, are remote. So how can we expect them to pay more? So I think it's important for academics to lead, provide the good science to practitioners and policy makers to make sure we have a level playing field, a, a fair playing field for green technologies. Yeah. Uh, Simon, um, I mean, we talked about international negotiations, but for a second, um, it's important to also look at the sec sectoral approach. What role um, do you see for sectoral approach, for example, shipping, I know you're very much involved with that, in decarbonisation, and also how um, can international organisations like IMO facilitate um, these efforts towards decarbonisation? So, globally, politically, on the news, the news headlines, you know, they focus in on these cops, right? They actually focus in, there's three weeks a year that we're going to solve the climate crisis. But actually, sectors all over the world, cities, different uh, infrastructure projects are happening all over the place. And that also includes different uh, UN branches, for example. The International Maritime Organization is here in London. Unfortunately, I get to go to those negotiations as well. And it's in my, the city I live in, which is fantastic. Last year, um, they had a breakthrough in July. On July 7th last year, they adopted the greenhouse gas strategy. This was two weeks of negotiations between countries, much like the COPs, right? And it could, could be criticized that it didn't quite reach the 1.5 degree target as set out in Paris, but actually it was a breakthrough in having industry agree on targets for 2030, 2040, and 2050. Um, it's because of that or way one of the reasons for that, when we went to COP28, there were over 80 side events focusing on this particular industry. So even though it's not necessarily talked about in the wider dialogue of the UNFCCC, and that's one of the, our jobs here, is what, what we want to do, is bring shipping, which has been, is run far too under the radar uh, for far too long in terms, of, in terms of emissions, right? Shipping accounts for, 3% of global emissions. That doesn't sound like a whole lot when you say 3%, but if it was a country, it would be in the top 10. It would be, it would be a bigger emitter than Germany, for example. But also, the world, the globe, all of us, we are heavily reliant on this industry. So we need that, uh, that industry being brought into that wider dialogue to reduce emissions. Here at UCL, for example, uh, we are working with our member states in the Caribbean, on the African continent, the Pacific, in order to, to push these forward, to use these energies that Mark Maslin mentioned, or, and Garrett Reese mentioned, that we, we, they already exist, right? We have these energy systems. We just need to be, they just need to be used. And I think sectorally, um, for, for me, it's fascinating, because I, for over a decade, work on these global climate negotiations. Climate change is a wicked problem. Climate change, when we think of this huge, we need to save the planet sort of problem, it's really hard to get our heads around. But if you focus on infrastructure, if you focus in on cities, if you focus in on shipping, and we can work with our engineers, with our country parties, with all these people to look at technical solutions, they're there. And so it's actually quite gratifying for me sometimes in the world of climate change to actually go into a ship, for example, and see how that, not that I understand anything about political sciences, but, but how that would particularly work and how that can be part of the solution. Um, now let's... Um look at it from a different perspective, so from cities and those sectors up to the international negotiations. Mark, you already touched on that, that um, cities 
learn from each other and they copy each other, if you could elaborate on that. But also, um, do you think that C40 is influential at the COP negotiations? Yes, I'll come back that's to that. The, the, the first bit first. I mean, so that they're, they're kind of learning from each other. That's, that's what C40 is all about. You know, our, our theory of change is that all 100 cities can go faster if they copy from each other rather than have to invent for themselves. And it, you, know, you see it in a thousand areas today. We've launched today a, a guide about climate budgeting. This is something that started in Oslo. Uh, the principle is that you agree to marry the annual financial budget setting process to the annual carbon budget target. So effectively, you can't, you can't pass the council budget unless you can show it will deliver the emission reduction that has been agreed upon for that year. So it, it creates a whole of government approach to tackling the climate crisis, what we need to see in every government in the world doing. Started in, you know, in Oslo, in Scandinavia, uh, just recently Mumbai, Bangalore and India have announced that they're following the same approach, Rio in Brazil, spreading right across the world, New York, London, uh, Paris. Or you see the more kind of direct, Tokyo um, has just been advising Kuala Lumpur on how to set up um, a carbon trading scheme for its commercial buildings that's been so successful in Tokyo, cut their emissions from private buildings about 30% in the, the commercial buildings in the space of five or six years. Or I guess, you know, the really big ones are when, when you, you see a whole global market shift because a group of as cities has, has just transformed what is is seen to be possible. I remember lots of conversations with mayors in, in, in Europe and North America a few years ago being exasperated when they were telling me they couldn't electrify their bus fleets until 2035, 2040. And then I was able to say to them, but hold on a minute, Shenzhen in China, 100% of their 12,000 buses are already fully electric in 20, 2020. How come you can't get there till 2035? And it went, you know, that, that flicks a light bulb on. The advice they've been given is wrong. They start to see what's actually possible out there. And now we see, you know, a, a really rapid shift through Latin America, Europe, North America, right through the world. And now African cities starting to be able to, to buy those electric buses as well. So we can see that, that that really works. It's not enough. And then to come back to the second part of your question, because I think it, with the best will in the world, even with these big, powerful city governments, they can affect about half the emissions in, the, in their city. And that's, you know, that's using all of the political power as well as the formal Power. And so ultimately you do need national governments to, to go a lot faster and really follow, follow the science. Do, does C40 make a difference? Well, I think you know, one, one thing Mark didn't mention is in his excellent summary of, of what happened at COP28 this year was that 71 of the governments there agreed to a new initiative called CHAMP. I instantly forgot what the acronym stands for, but what it's about is those 71 countries, and critically includes Brazil, who will host COP30, uh, and the United States, to re-look at their nationally determined commitments in the light of what's been delivered by the cities in their country. And we know the cities are going faster and further already. And to help them then ratchet up their commitment as we move into 2025 at COP in Brazil, but also then to re-look at the legislation, the regulation, the investment that can be made at a national government level that can help those city governments go even faster. So I think if that, that's what we're, we're really focused on at C40 now, I think if that can really happen, then, then we start to see that city, city leaders are not just sort of politically ahead and driving climate action, but actually start to really shift the national action as well in some countries. Um, now I have a question for all of you, and I was kind of debating on whether or not to ask this question, so I'm really glad, Simon, that you mentioned when we were talking about these international negotiations. Um, I couldn't make it to COP28, but I was, of course, uh, following and covering the news, and that was just full of rage and anger at some point, um, and this is post uh, pre-COP. The number of lobbyists representing fossil fuel interests mm -hmm. at COP28 has reached an all-time high. And um, we know that the leaked information um, discovered by BBC told us about the oil and gas side deals at COP28. But even looking back at COP27, the representatives from oil companies outnumbered the combined number of delegates from the top 10 most vulnerable countries 
to climate change. I mean, that's, that's just appalling. And you mentioned again, Simon, Mukhtar Babayev, a veteran of the oil and gas, now the Minister of Ecology and Natural Resources of um, Azerbaijan, has been appointed the president in waiting for the COP29 climate negotiations. So, my question, I mean, I'm having a hard time with this and, you know, the, the domination of uh, <laughs> oil giants. But how do you perceive implications of such industry influence on global climate negotiations? I mean, we know how important they are, particularly in the light of the Paris Agreement objectives. Pretty shall we? Start I share with your you. frustration, absolutely. I mean, I've been to three COPs and I'm wondering why can we not do something about our COPs? Uh, but I understand that's complicated, but it's extremely frustrating that we're going to end up in another oil nation again. And for me, it's coming back to the point I made earlier that if we want kind of to scale up some of the green solutions, we need to create this level playing field. And having the lobbies on kind of infiltrate COP means we do not have this level playing field to scale up those solutions. And for me, that's problematic for a few reasons. Because we got communities around the world who are getting new infrastructure which will be clean, but it's going to be more expensive, which means they get knocked off the infrastructure and they do not have access to basic services. But equally, we're seeing fuel poverty shape and play out in UK, and it's narrowing down our options here in this country because of the lobbying, because of the lack of subsidy and support. So for me, that's a big source of frustration. Thank you, Simon. I mean, they were already there. They've been there for, since the beginning, right? If you look at US politics or, you know, there, there was a whole debate when when Trump or Hillary Clinton was going to win the presidential, then they're like, oh my God, Trump's gonna be terrible for the environment. True. But was Hillary Clinton going to be that much better for the environment as well, right? She had big oil in her, her back pocket as well. So I guess um, to be pessimistic about it, the, the uh, at COP26 in Glasgow as well, as well as these, all these COPs, uh, a lot of the oil industry were under country party badges as well. But we know that they're there. We know that it's, it's completely frustrating that they're able to lobby and be part of the discussion in a COP. I 100% completely agree they shouldn't be there in that capacity. I guess another way to take it is that we do need to have industry at the table. And, and so um, something that you said, Mark, struck me as well when I was thinking about with, uh, the shipping industry and how frustrating it can be uh, when industry, for example, says they're not ready, they're not going to be moving to fossil fuel, uh, away from fossil fuels till 2040. That's when they're going to be ready. That's mm -hmm. false. This is blatantly false. But if you have them at the table saying that, this was the first cop I had, I, someone from the industry actually turned away, turned their back on me. And I thought it was a very proud moment. Because, they, <laughs> they, because, they, because I knew that they were there, I, they understood who I was. As soon as they found out I was UCL, they were like, no. And so, uh, all that to say, uh, Perhaps I'm frustrated they're there, but maybe uh, like what does the sheep and wolves call their wolf and sheep's clothing? Perhaps is the good analogy where we just we need to call them out on it because we need them to act as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the thing. You know, we're completely right to be angry and frustrated. They, they, this the fossil fuel industry has held back the whole of humanity uh, for multiple decade, decades now. On, on, on the climate crisis. That's why we, you know, we are only getting, we're celebrating having the first mentions of fossil fuels right. and cutting them out in a, in a cop. It's, it's extraordinary. And, but if you think back to this time last year, the fossil fuel industry was really emboldened. This is, this is a sector that thrives on human suffering and with conflict around the world driving up oil and gas prices, the, the, the oil and gas industry was feeling confident. Uh, again, and had managed to get a, a, a narrative that in this moment of crisis we can't afford to move away from the existing industries and into this risky renewable energy and tackling climate change. And they were really what you what they were really hoping to achieve out of COP28 was not was to not not a small step forward, which is what we did achieve, but a big step backwards because they were trying to change the whole narrative that we shouldn't focus on stopping the use of fossil fuels, just reducing emissions, because we can capture the carbon with these technologies that don't really exist yet. So 
I think, you know, we should, we've got to, despite that massive presence, they didn't win at, at this COP. In fact, they were pushed back a, back a little bit and we, we got language about transitioning away from fossil fuels, which in the world of COP is a, is a step forward, is a, is a success. I think the longer term solution, and, you know, all, all praise to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres here, has just been the most magnificent leader over the, as he is on so many issues on, on climate change in the last year, because he just called out constantly, it's about fossil fuels, it's about stopping using fossil fuels. That's what COP's got to be at. Kept that, kept that message going. He's also what he's been trying to do, as many of those Cristiano Figueres and previous COP um, executive secretaries have, have tried to do, is change the balance of, of who is at COP and, and who's part of that, putting that pressure. And that's why you know, one of those constituencies is cities, where for the first time, a local leaders summit at the start of COP alongside the presidents and prime ministers. So you're getting a positive, progressive pressure on climate, pushing at the time that all the leaders are there. And we need to replicate that for civil society and the progressive parts of business and push out the parts of business that are trying to hold us back, which is the fossil fuel industry. Indeed, thank you. Um, if I may, I, I would like to now open the floor to questions from our audience, um, both in person and online, of course. The lady over there, we have the mic coming to you. And more questions from our online attendees here. T, you mentioned uh, a triple whammy um, in the beginning of your um, in the beginning of the talk. Is it not a quadruple whammy that we're looking at? Because yes, these um, the low to middle income countries are responsible for a very small portion uh, of the emissions, but also the wealth, the prosperity, the wealth of choice. Um, that we're enjoying in, in the developed countries is actually at the backs of those people, at the exploitation and um, extraction of their resources and the exploitation of their communities. So actually we're looking at a quadruple whammy, I think, which is also very important, also in terms of loss and damage. And um, just to give an example, I was in Amsterdam um, last week and obviously, it's Amsterdam's aiming to be fully circular by 2050, sustainability initi initiatives galore in the Netherlands. It's, you know, very um, forward thinking. Um, but somebody also mentioned um, today as a time of self-reflection, so I'm going to go on that, expand on that a little bit. Um, for example, um, Indonesia was a colony, former colony of the Netherlands, and yes, that's all in the past, etc. But is it really? Because right now, as of today, um, the Netherlands, while being aiming to be fully circular uh, in um, the city of Amsterdam, um, etc., they are actually um, exporting um, hundreds of millions of kilos of plastic waste to Indonesia and to other vulnerable countries. So the inequality in other forms still exists. And we, we all know what's happening in Congo and its relation to our electric cars, our you know, renewable energy, etc., etc. So I'm very interested in, in all your takes on this, but I don't want to take up too much time. So I don't know if one of you wants to pick it up, um, but how do we marry the two, like inequality as a central part of climate justice and um, also biodiversity loss and, and equity? Sorry for the long question. I can get a start, I guess. Uh, absolutely, I agree with you, it's quadruple, uh, because we don't have a level playing field or a good starting point. We have communities who are struggling on a daily basis to make ends meet. Uh, they do not have access to healthcare, they do not have access to education. So they are bypassed from kind of urban kind of planning and developmental processes, right? Uh, and what happens is with the shocks and stresses of climate change, it further reduces their ability to engage in day-to-day -day lives and be kind of engaged in productive citizens. I'm going to introduce the fifth whammy now, which is gender, uh, because within those communities, there's women and children who also 
bear a further burden because they are the ones who often are collecting water, disposing water. They are the ones who have carrying responsibilities. So in extreme heat conditions, if a family member falls ill, who takes care of them? So I'm going to say that it's the fifth whammy as well. You're absolutely right. We have to address kind of some of the fundamental problems in society. And COVID brought that to the forefront as well. What COVID highlighted is the populations who were most deprived really suffered the adverse impact of COVID. Um, so I think addressing that inequity is a big deal. The reason why I personally advocate for infrastructure is because infrastructure can address not only climate change, but it can start addressing some of those inequities by providing improved access to education, improved health outcomes. So that's why I personally focus a lot on campaign for infrastructure. Uh, yeah, and uh, I mean, we always say at the climate reality that uh, climate change is a social justice issue. Uh, and that is why I think climate justice and environmental justice is at the core of what um, we do and all these movements. Uh, we are very much aware of that inequality. Uh, would you like to pick up on that and then we carry on with the yeah. question? Um, that's, that's a great question. And if I see you could do students. it very quickly. Yeah, very, very quickly. Thank it, you. It, it's just this idea uh, uh, that colonization is over is false. As, as you know, I used to live in Kenya, and, and when you're in Kenya, you're, it's very much a, a, a present uh, topic of discussion. Um, something that we have to be aware of is the massive amounts of extraction that are still happening in a lot of the Global South countries. Uh, that are still happening. We have to be aware of this, something that raised its head, and I will be quick, okay. uh, in, in a panel on just transition that I organized at COP28, was that I was, one of our partners was uh, James Minupe. He's the, he's the green hydrogen advisor for Namibia. And so I had a walk with him, and he was basically saying to me, because he was wondering about my project. I'm like, okay, we have this project that's been funded by Germany, and it's, uh, it's looking at green ammonia and green hydrogen in Namibia. And he's like, why are you interested in us? And that's because, and I didn't realize until after the panel, because he, he is so used to other countries like Germany coming in and extracting that, where our project is trying to use that, those technologies, use those, those energies in country. Like, at the end of the day, nobody can do what they want with the energy they produce, but that, the idea is that it stays in country. Thank you. Um, I have a question here for you, Mark from our online attendees. Do state or national politics have a major role in what cities are actually able to do? How much are they driven or limited by state or national? I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. And, and I mean, it, it, it kind of varies, varies massively. You know, it, we have 13, 14 member cities in China, the, the national strategy on climate is completely indivisible from, from the city strategy. In many ways, that's incredibly effective because that means you've got a lot of certainty about the direction that the economy um, is going in. The, the cities have some freedom to, to experiment. So you see the kind of innovation happening in things like electric vehicles, district level renewable um, energy, but essentially it's driven by a national strategy. I think we, you know, where it's problematic is where you can see policies that are really working at a city level that are then not able to, to spread um, effectively. So some of the examples I've men mentioned today, New York stands out for its really strong regulation over existing buildings because it's got a stronger power than most of the other big cities in the United States for, you know, for reasons of kind of history of how the governance of New York was set up, if that could be replicated all around, all across the US, you'd have a much faster shift to renewable energy, much faster shift to lower bills for people in, in big cities and a, re a reduction in air pollution. And so, you know, I think often what we're, we're trying to do is, is now, particularly through this new, this CHAMP initiative that's come out of the last COP, is show the national government the opportunity if they're willing to cede a little bit of power or put in place legislation that allows uh, every city to do what one city can do, it's going to help them achieve national targets. But also, there's a bit of political expediency here. It, it allows the city level leaders who are a bit braver, often more willing to, to move fast to take the political risk. You know, ULES, which is now being looked at by 20 other big cities across the world to, to, to copy, wouldn't have happened if it was led by the national government in the UK because the pressure would have been too much, but a, a strong and brave mayor 
uh, convinced that Londoners are going to back him in the end is able to do it. Thank you, Mark. Um, there are so many wonderful questions here, and I'm sure here in the audience they have. But I think we have time for only one more question. Uh, the gentleman there. Thank you. If you could please just um, make it as short as possible. Yeah, um, short as possible is my, my background is with indigenous communities. I'm very connected with them, different countries around the world. And the solutions we're being told to go green, the outcomes, net zero, um, of course they're gonna be saying it's net zero because it's, it's only looking at the point of extraction to the point of consumption. The biggest area, the anomaly, is where those indigenous people are, but they're not there anymore because they've been ripped out, the forests have been stripped out, the land has been mined, the women have been raped, the children have been put into sex scandals, sex rings, so they can mine the resources. I see my friends in Congo, I see my friends in Ghana, they're telling me, you, you've seen the stuff in Palestine, you think that's bad in the last six months. This has been going on for 10 years, millions of people have been killed so we can get the cobalt. So no matter how much people dress it up, the renewables are green. They're tainted in a red color of the blood of Africans and Indians of West Papuans. I don't know how people are going to dress this up to me that this is green and sustainable to make a carbon capturing device by removing a thousand year old forest going back times before Christ and you're going to tell me that the water lost, the women abused, all that stuff is going to be sustainable. And at the end of it, people say, oh, Saga, this is a trade-off. A trade-off? For what? So the women are raped, that's a trade-off? Again, the game is still the same two or three hundred years later after fossil fuels were given as a solution to us Indians and Africans. Come back, finish off the job. And who is it for? It's not for me. The brown person is not for the white people. It's not for the individual countries. It's for the World Economic Forum. Yeah, there I said it. Why are we not talking about it? Why are we not looking at the fact that in, across Europe, Canada, Germany, Spain and France and India now, you've got the small farmers blockading and standing up and saying, we're not gonna take this anymore. So if we're really going to talk about sustainability, those small farmers in India who are trying to protect their land and food for us in the UK, who did they lose their land to? They lost their land to land being mined for renewables so we could be green. So you can't have your cake and eat it. And this is the problem with the West. Have our cake and eat it and completely ignore the resources that we ripped out from the global south. And now the global south is saying, like Nigerians, Western Africa, Please, France, get out of our country. You've taken enough money, you've taken enough land, and we want our sovereignty back. And we want to be at the table. If you are not gonna let us in at the G7, we'll do our G20, we'll have our BRICS nations. We are fed up of it. So the question is, when are we really going to start talking about outcomes which is not beneficial for the WF and the UN, but it's beneficial for the billions of people who do not want to be under this autocratic power. Thank you. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your thoughts. I mean, I grew up and lived in India for 20 years. Um, and as a teenager, uh, I used to go around and walk around in slums. And at that point, it struck me that people live very different lives. I was living in a comfortable home, but there were people in my city who were not living in a comfortable home. Uh, that was the point. As a teenager, it struck me that the world is not an equal place. Absolutely. And interesting enough, when I started embarking on research on clean cooking, the biggest ethical dilemma was, should I be doing research on LPG? But then, then I looked into the fact that if we were not researching LPG, what would happen? Women would have to go spend hours walking into forest, get raped, because there's no... Jesus. Oh. <laughs> Emphasis. <laughs> Emphasis. <laughs> that was not the effect I was hoping for. <laughs> 
But the thing is, I, there was an ethical dilemma because the power of didn't want to research LPG, but I said, well, if no one looks at LPG as a transition solution, we'll have women walking into forests, getting raped, spending hours collecting fuel, indoor air pollution for themselves and their children. So I think all of us have to be very nuanced and aware of what's happening. So thank you for raising the points you have today. Thank you. And uh, once again, pretty parry, the Simon Chi win, and um, I hope I pronounced it properly, Chin Yi. And Mark Watts, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for all your questions.